Today on Ham Radio Q&A, your questions answered, so please keep watching for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio q and I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover in this month's mailbag, so let's dig right into it. In the recent video on the Chameleon MCOM3 antenna that myself and uh, guest host Joe, KD9CGX, put together, uh, it generated a quite a bit of questions. All of them great. You know, and it can be difficult to uh, cover every aspect of a product during a review. So we're going to do a, a little bit of a follow-up information on, uh, that, that came about uh, when we did the review. So first off, Robert asks, does this one depend on a tuner more than, say, a half-wave N-fed would? Uh, well, with the Chameleon NCOM3, the SWR for us was around 2 to 1. And Chameleon states that the SWR should be in that 1.4 to 1 to 2 to 1 range, uh, depending on the band. I think with careful deployment, you could probably use it without a tuner. And the SWR can be easily managed with an internal tuner if your rig has one. We used a portable external tuner. Uh, it was the MFJ901B to give us a good match for the radio. And I think adding a small external tuner to your kit isn't a bad idea as it gives you a bit of flexibility if the antenna isn't giving you a good match. Uh, what I do is I've got an old MFJ945 that I picked up years ago at a ham fest and you can usually find these little um, portable or travel tuners around twenty dollars so uh, watch for them at your next ham fest and grab one if you see it. Next up Lee asks how will it do for NVIS or near vertical incident skywave propagation? Well, we did not test it as such, but Chameleon markets it as an NVIS antenna. Uh, we had the antenna up about 20, 25 feet, which was probably a little bit outside of the NVIS zone. Uh, one configuration that you can do is with an inverted V uh, with the ends of the antenna near the ground and the apex up about 15 feet. Doing this would increase its NVIS characteristics, and I think. Um, if we put the antenna in up in that manner, we would have heard a lot more uh, stations closer to us. Rob asks, is there any concerns uh, with tree branches touching the actual antenna as it goes to the tree? You know, I really don't believe so. Uh, the wire is insulated, so a branch touching it shouldn't be a big deal. A couple smaller branches were touching um, in, our, in our deployment of the antenna. But, you know, with it being wintertime, uh, we didn't have any foliage to con contend with, and those branches uh, I believe didn't cause any problems. Finally, uh, WW5M warns us about using slingshots. Throw the slingshot away. I almost broke my fingers once. String got tangled and snagged something and a three ounce weight hit me on the top of the fingers. Thought, I was, thought it was broken, but I just got lucky. Yep, you know, slingshots, they can be dangerous and like any device that launches a projectile, you should observe proper safety precautions. He then continues on uh, how he goes about launching an antenna line. A water bottle with only a small amount of water and use a fishing line, monofilament. Both are slick, so they slide a lot better. I use 10 pound, then uh, tie to a heavier string or cord. But then, um, but put the roll of mono in a coffee can or a bucket. That will save tons of headaches. Plus lay the spool on its side so if it will fall off and not have to spin the spool. And then he goes on to say, I use 200 pound black trout line string. Uh, once the heavier cord is over, then attach antenna and hoist it up, you know, 20 feet or more. For more height, uh, get a kid's bow and arrow. Use the same procedure, 10 pound mono first, otherwise uh, heavier cord will reduce its height. Plus an, add, an added weight to the tip of the arrow by taping a couple of large hex nuts to it. Sometimes the arrow isn't, isn't heavy enough and it'll, and it'll pull the string in some cases. So even more height, I uh, use a full-size compound bow. Uh, I can clear a 90-foot tree easily with that. Plus I use a 20-pound monofilament and then pull the 200-pound cord. 10 pounds is borderline at those heights. Any snag will pull 10 pound as it's breaking point fast. I've even broken the 20 pound actually, but it usually works. So uh, thanks a lot for those tips and um, on on launching, launching an antenna line, I've, I've seen a lot of different methods, so um, you know, maybe you want to give some of those a try. 
And thanks for those questions about the chameleon. Keep them coming. Once it warms up and the snow disappears, I'll be doing a lot more portable operations. So I plan to revisit this antenna in the future. So please stay tuned for that. Okay, and my Subaru Outback mobile radio install still generates a few questions and comments. Uh, first off, K8MH uh, mentioned. You know, with the display down low, I have two concerns. First, it's more distracting to look down than higher. And second, does the GPS lock up okay down lower? To a certain extent, you are correct. Distracted driving is an important concern and mounting the control head within your eye line, like on a dashboard, will keep your eyes on the road. But I'm not really a fan of dash mounts as they can reduce your visibility otherwise or become a projectile during a crash. So I guess you're gonna have to weigh uh, those placement concerns with um, uh, when installing the radio. But in locating the head midway down, I find that I can give it a quick glance without taking my eyes off the road. Still, distracted driving is a serious concern and I'm not sure if there's any one location for a radio head that eliminates that risk. So for, um, and as for your second point, I don't have any issues with the GPS getting a signal lock in that spot. It seems to still have a, a pretty clear view of the sky and GPS works almost 100% of the time for me. I also had a couple unrelated comments about the wiring in the engine compartment. First off, it was mentioned that um, where I slit the grommet to get the power through the firewall, it should be weatherproofed. And I agree, I agree with that. And as it gets warmer, or I'm gonna put some silicone sealer in that spot to minimize water penetration. And then the second point is from Nick. Nice job. One recommendation. Uh, you you might want to think about getting some black split loom to put uh, your power and ground wire in under the hood. Makes the wiring look much more factory and then add zip ties every 12 to 18 inches. You can buy this stuff at almost any car audio shop. The split loom will certainly dress up the install and make things more professional. Basically, split loom is a flexible tube with a slit down the middle and um, that you can use as a channel to protect the wiring from abrasion. I left the split loom off to illustrate the wiring path of the engine in the engine compartment, but I most likely will go back to it and, and redo the wiring with split loom as it gets warmer for an added bit of protection. Finally, Joshua writes, have you seen any affordable APRS HTs? The Kenwoods are nice, but they're very expensive. Well, you know, there aren't very many APRS integrated HTs. The Kenwoods D7A series and the Yaesu VX8R series are both out of production, and you can find, still find them used. I've, I've had my VX8R for over 10 years, and I still use it as my APRS portable. Otherwise, for new radios, uh, we've got the Kenwood THD72A and their newer digital D74A, and Yesu's FT2DR offer APRS out of the box. But now a fourth option uh, that might be priced a little bit better is the Anytone ATD878. It sells for a little over $200, and along with um, a dual band DMR digital support, it also can do DMR APRS and, anal and it is analog APRS cap capable. Being a DMR radio though, there's gonna be a little bit of a steeper learning curve, but it seems to be priced right. And I'll see if I can get a uh, unit in here to um, test out for its APRS support. So look for that in the future too. Well, that's it for this month. Uh, keep those questions coming. You can leave them in the comments below. And who knows, uh, your, yours might be featured in an upcoming video. But for more articles and information, be sure to check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Your support of this channel drives the production of future videos. So if you like this video, give me that big thumbs up. And uh, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. And check out some of the other videos that are recommended right alongside here. You may find them interesting. Well, that's it for this month. I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day and 73.